Okay, let's see. All right. Uh, good morning. Hello again. Wonderful day. Uh, liquid analyzer introduction ILM 310304 DA. Uh, starting out looking at the basic introduction to liquid analyzer. So, uh, we've got one, two, or three objectives here dealing uh, with general liquid analyzer kind of stuff. And then we start moving into uh, pH analyzers uh, in the last couple of objectives. And there's some funky math in there uh, that we're going to have to do. Um, but that is the nature of the beast. So let's have a look at what we got going on here today. Objective number one, uh, describe the applications of liquid analyzers. So again, very general information here regarding uh, all liquid analyzers and specifically the ones that we're going to look at uh, in this year's course material. Liquid analyzers, what are they? They analyze processed liquids that use water as its major component. They are used extensively in water treatment and industrial product applications, and we'll address some of the applications, water, wastewater, pulp, paper, brewing, foods, boiler feed water, uh, lots of different applications where we use water. Uh, when we're analyzing uh, for water quality, we use six different types of analyzers, and these are the six types of analyzers that we are covering in the three ILMs for liquid analyzers. Uh, so we have pH, which of course measures the pH of water or the acidity, acidity uh, of water or the alkalinity of water. Uh, we have specific ion analyzers, which are, as the name would imply, designed to measure specific types of ions. Uh, common ones uh, in drinking water, for example, we add fluorine uh, or fluoride to our drinking water. So we would have a fluoride specific ion analyzer to measure the concentrations of fluoride added to, to drinking water. Uh, ORP or oxygen oxygen reduction potential uh, analyzers, uh, pretty much just like the name describes here, uh, measure the amount of oxidizing and reducing materials and that'll give you a little shiver back to uh, chemistry where we talked about oxidation. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, conductivity analyzers, uh, which measure, as the name would imply, conductivity, and conductivity is relative to uh, the purity of water. Uh, pure water, again, having not much conductivity, uh, and conductivity changes or increases, uh, basically relying on the amount of dissolved salts that are in the water. Turbidity uh, analyzers measure suspended solids in water uh, or measure the clarity of water. Dissolved oxygen. Uh, remember in liquid analyzers here, not gas analyzers, I, uh, back in gas analyzers, I said we'd be looking at oxygen again. Uh, and here we are, uh, liquid analyzers looking at dissolved oxygen. So dissolved oxygen is the concentration of dissolved oxygen gas in a liquid. So these are the four types of analyzers that we're going to be looking at in the liquid analyzer section. Water quality monitoring, uh, one of the applications for liquid analyzers. Uh, water and wastewater treatment for or from humans uses many of the analyzers that we've discussed there, probably most of them. Uh, dissolved oxygen, pH, turbidity, ORP, and specific ions. Uh, you'll find them all in uh, water and wastewater treatment applications. And the next slide will kind of show you where they fall into the industrial process. Uh, this is a flow diagram of a wastewater treatment facility, uh, kind of showing you uh, what is measured and general, very generally what areas of the plant or plant process that you would find these types of analyzers. So uh, I can speak relatively intelligently about this, being that I've worked at a wastewater plant for a, a few years there, um, and I can uh, I can vouch for the fact that this is actually legitimately true. Um, so pH uh, is measured as the raw wastewater comes into, into the plant, just to give you a basic idea of what kind of material it is that you're dealing with. Uh, we have oxygen, oxygen reduction potential uh, transmitters um, that uh, are in place, and they measure the, uh, the digesting ability 
um, of, of the process. The part of wastewater, of course, is to break down the solids uh, into organic materials that aren't poop anymore. Uh, and in order to do that, there's chemical reactions in which um, organisms uh, feed, on, feed on the poop, essentially. Um, and we can measure the uh, activity of the reaction that occurs in, in that uh, process with an oxygen reduction potential type analyzer. Uh, turbidity uh, is, again, the clarity of, of the water. So as we come out of a primary clarifier, we're going to want to measure the amount of solids that are in there. Uh, the secondary clarifier, uh, and as we put it up to the river, uh, all important to measure how much suspended solids are, are in the liquid. Uh, pH again gets measured somewhere else during the, the process and there's probably a couple of different places in here uh, to determine whether or not the treatment that we've been providing in the earlier parts of the process uh, has provided anything. So you'll see pH is a relatively common one uh, in wastewater. Dissolved oxygen um, is used in the aeration tanks. I guess I should drag that error arrow over here a little bit. What the aeration tank is, is a big giant swimming pool full of poop water, um, full of microorganisms that need oxygen uh, to live uh, so that they can consume all the biological stuff that's in the tank. Uh, so we have to maintain a certain amount of dissolved oxygen in there for these uh, microorganisms to live. And then as we go to the end of the wastewater process here, uh, just before we put the water back into the ecosystem here, we would also measure it for pH to make sure that we're not pumping acid uh, into the river. Uh, we measure for dissolved oxygen to make sure that we have enough oxygen in the water we're feeding back into the river so that we don't deplete the oxygen that is actually in the river for the organisms to live on. Uh, and there may also be uh, specific ion um, measurements made at this point also to measure the amount of uh, nitrogen and uh, phosphates and other things that go in there. Although at the Red Deer Wastewater Treatment Plant, we didn't have any specific ion measurements on the discharge of, of the process. But as you can see here, uh, water-based uh, industry, of course, using uh, just about all of the technology that we're going to be talking about in this set of ILMs. Potable water uses, uh, going from the dirty water side to the clean water side, you're going to find basically the same devices in, in that industrial process as well, um, with the exception of dissolved oxygen. And I could be wrong uh, on this, but I'm from the best that I can re recollect, uh, I don't remember ever seeing a dissolved oxygen uh, analyzer at the clean water plant. Uh, I have spent some time there, um, but I have noticed all just about all the other analyzers that we've uh, talked about already uh, at the potable water uh, facility here in town. Third application uh, that we're going to talk about based on water and where we'd use uh, liquid analyzers here is boiler feed water. And this is a pretty big one. Uh, boiler feed water is the water that's used to supply a boiler system. And before we can use raw water, uh, we have to make sure that it's relatively pure and we've removed the impurities and the way we know that is of course by analyzing the water uh, for the amount of solids that are in there, dissolved solids that are in there, dissolved gases, uh, high acidity or high alkalinity and all of these things of course uh, if you thought about it a little bit you would realize that if they're inside your piping system uh, and your boiler system um, once they get hot solids and dissolved solids tend to uh, drop out of the liquid and start coating the piping systems, causing pluggages and things like that. Uh, so that's problematic and a good reason for analyzing. Uh, dissolved gases, particularly oxygen, uh, again in your piping system, uh, oxygen will help promote uh, rusting, which is bad for the piping system. Same idea with uh, highly acidic or alkaline uh, processed liquids in a piping system. They have the effect of eroding or uh, corroding. Uh, piping system. So boiler feed water, uh, usually we try to make it as pure as we possibly can and as such it requires uh, quite a bit of analyzing. So to monitor for these uh, different components that you might find in raw water before we can use it for boiler feed water, we'll measure it for pH, uh, conductivity, dissolved oxygen and turbidity. So all these different analyzers also uh, come into play for boiler feed water. Some other applications um, mentioned in the ILM here, uh, industrial products, uh, 
and that's a pretty large blanketing statement here, but uh, uh, anything, again, water-based. Uh, a couple examples from the ILM include pulp and paper, and one of my favorites, brewing. Uh, both of these industries use water to either make uh, make the product or to process it. Pulp and paper, of course, is for processing, uh, for brewing. It's, uh, it's for making uh, beer, so that's awesome. Uh, we can find many of the analyzers uh, that we've discussed already in these industries as well. Um, of particular interest, I guess, if we want to tie some devices to particular industries and applications, pH and ORP are used for optimizing uh, the bleaching process and pulp and paper activities. pH balance is important in brewing, uh, as is turbidity for product filtering, unless you're a hipster uh, and you like cloudy beer uh, with food on the bottom of your beer bottle. Um, but that's a good application for turbidity. Um, wastewater, again, uh, I think we mentioned this in the previous slide, but before we put it back into the ecosystem uh, or the rivers, uh, we want to make sure that it's a neutral pH uh, before we discharge it into the water system. Of course, we don't want to destroy any of the ecosystem. So many applications uh, for different liquid analyzers, uh, water, wastewater, boiler feed water, and then some other industrial processes. Um, good to know what type of analyzers you can typically find in some of these applications. Next objective, objective two here, um, pretty generalized uh, section here on safety. Most of us at this point in time have had some time in the field and we're relatively aware of the safety precautions. But again, uh, just as we have to be aware of our environment and the concerns uh, for gas analyzers or uh, any other device for that matter, uh, the relevance also applies for liquid analyzers. Um, because there are some hazards, of course, involved. Uh, when working with liquid analyzers, always make sure that um, you're using the proper PPE in terms of eyewear and, and gloves and things like that, and that you're aware of uh, you know, the, the elements that you're dealing with. Uh, when working with liquid analyzers, you might come in contact with hot, corrosive, toxic, and dirty fluids. And if you worked at the wastewater treatment plant, you could get all of those in one. Um, knowing the consequences and possibilities for danger will help you ensure your well-being, of course. Um, always check your safety data sheets and manuals for relevant data or contact your supervisor if you're not sure what you're dealing with. Always wear proper PPE. Um, for those of you who don't know, acids can cause severe burns, so can bases. Uh, wastewater may be toxic. You had, had to get like a twin Rix vaccination before you started working there, uh, so you didn't get the HEP. Um, but again, there's all kinds of different hazards out there, whether they're toxic, corrosive, or biohazards, so you must be uh, aware of what's going on and what you're playing with. Always be sure that the system is depressurized before removing any sensors or probes from the service. So we have typical uh, installation here where we are grabbing a, a sample in a fast bypass loop here, and we got all kinds of different hardware. And this section of the ILM pages 10 and 11 kind of walks you through the proper operating uh, process for taking a analyzer out of service and putting it back into service um, without getting into too much detail. Uh, the long story short is always make sure that you isolate, drain, and remove pressure safely. So the ILM walks through uh, the process of uh, closing the isolation valves and draining off the pressure and all that kind of wonderful stuff. But again, be aware of the proper procedure uh, for the device that you are dealing with. Uh, these couple of images here uh, show some sensor probes that are inserted into the process. Uh, and I believe in the ILM, the context that they're dealing with here is uh, if you can't depressurize the system, if you don't have an arrangement like this with block valves and bleed valves and drains and all that kind of stuff, uh, you'll have to use a, a removable probe um, with a, a compression style uh, seal. And um, there are certain hazards, of course, associated with removing a probe while it's under uh, while it's under pressure, and you'll see some things in here related to the probe, such as a safety strap uh, that will keep the probe from shooting out of the process line as you undo it. 
Uh, and for those of you who have never done this, to save you a little bit of reading, the general process here is to uh, slightly loosen your, um, your packing nut here, start pulling the probe out. Once the end of the probe gets past the ball, you can isolate the uh, quarter turn ball valve. And then once you do that, you can remove the probe uh, the rest of the way. But again, anytime you're dealing with something under pressure, be very, very careful. More on safety here, uh, talking about the calibration materials with these liquid analyzers. Uh, they're often, uh, if we're talking about pH specifically, dealing with acids and bases. So again, reinforcing the fact, make sure you use the proper PPE and read the safety data sheets, read the manual. If you have any questions, make sure that you are sure of what you're dealing with. Um, maintenance for some of these devices is um, basically limited to cleaning the sensor probes uh, and the sensor heads. Uh, and something you need to be aware about when you're doing that is that some of the sensor cleaning solutions uh, can be hazardous. Uh, hydrochloric acid, uh, is often used as is an isopropyl alcohol. Uh, either one of these in, in the face uh, would cause you to have a pretty rough, uh, pretty rough few minutes. So again, safety is relatively important as, as it always is. All right, so that's kind of the uh, general introduction to liquid analyzers. Objective three comes up next here where we start shifting our focus on to specific types of analyzers. And initially we are going to look at the pH analyzer. Uh, the pH analyzer again uh, is used for measuring the uh, acidity or alkalinity of uh, a water-based fluid. And I am going to show you a little video right now, which will make the next three or four slides uh, a little bit less painful. Uh, the video itself is a little bit high energy for this time of the day. Um, but I think it, it, it uh, does a good job of capturing uh, the essence of what's coming at you in the next three or four slides and should make it a little bit more relatable. So with any luck here, uh, I will stop sharing the PowerPoint and uh, we'll click over to uh, looking at this video here. So let's see if I can get the video to appear in a happy, happy way for me here. People with ADHD take 10 hours studying for this chrome extension. But no, by all means, go ahead, skip the out, save a few seconds. I have to do a lot of reading for my job, you know, emails, reports, write ups. This may come as a bit of a shock to you, but I'm not super into personal grooming. Like, I understand soap and shampoo, but there's all this other stuff. Now, and I keep seeing references to pH balance everywhere. pH balance, soaps, and shampoos, and deodorant, and makeup abound in supermarkets and drugstores, and I've even seen pH balance water. We talked a lot about balance over the last couple of weeks, and pH balance is related to the equilibrium state of a reversible reaction. We're also probably familiar with the pH scale, and you know that it has to do with acids and bases, but what is pH exactly, and why is it weirdly written with a lowercase p and a capital H? And also, what about pH's alter ego, pOH? The capitalization thing is probably the easiest to answer, because there is no answer. No one really knows what the p means. But then this chemist who came up with the term, the guy with the absolutely amazing name, Sergeant Sergeantson, never explained his reason. Some people think that it comes from some form of the word power, whether it's puissance in French or maybe Latin pondus. But it probably just came from a common habit. Chemists have a differentiating test solution labeled P from a reference solution called P. But thinking of the P as standing for power does help us remember the meaning more easily. The H part is even easier. It stands for hydrogen because hydrogen ions or protons are pivotal to the behavior of acids and bases, which is what pH describes. So you can think of pH as basically the power of hydrogen in the solution, the strength of the acid or base character of a substance. And it all revolves around one very important point of focus, our old friend water. <laughs> If you've been watching Crash Course Chemistry from the beginning, you've gotten the message that water is special in more ways than I can list, and pH is just one more of those ways. We normally think of water as a perfectly neutral substance, neither acidic nor basic, and that's true. But, as I've 
mentioned before, water can also function as an acid, releasing hydrogen ions, also known as protons, and as a base, consuming them. How on earth is that possible? In order to explain, we first have to understand what the pH of the substance really tells us. While chemically, we say that pH represents the power of hydrogen in the solution, it's mathematically defined as the negative of the base 10 logarithm of the concentration of hydrogen ions in solution. Okay, so now that you're terrified, I'm here to help. So yeah, logarithms can seem a little bit scary at first, but the ones that we need to hear are super easy. And bonus, once you get familiar with them here, it'll be that much easier to understand in math class. So now that we got the scary mathematical definition, let's do the simplest mathematical definition. At any given moment, there will be a certain number of hydrogen ions in solution, a very small number. The concentration will be a number like 1 times 10 to the negative 5 moles per liter. That negative 5 is your base 10 logarithm. Take the negative of that, and you get the pH. Five. Now to get a bit more into the weeds, the logarithm or log of a number is the exponent to which another number called the base must be raised to produce the target number. So for base 10 log, the base is 10. They're what we use most in chemistry and they're really easy to understand and also what we base scientific notation on. So as an example, the base 10 logarithm of 100 is 2 because 10 raised to the power of 2 or 10 squared equals 100. Base 10 logs are so common that we often leave the subscript 10 off when we write it. Like if your calculator has a log button, that's just for base 10 logs. So what in the name of sir and sir and sir does this have to do with base melting acids? Well, I'm getting to that, and it all starts with water's crazy potential to act as both an acid and a base. Random changes in the tiny electrical fields around the atoms in water occasionally cause the molecules to break apart. Specifically, a hydrogen ion, or proton, will break off from one molecule and attach itself to another one, forming a hydronium ion, H3O+, and a hydroxide ion, OH-. This is why water can act as both an acid and a base. Its molecules can both release and accept protons. In this case, it's only interacting with itself, but water can interact in the same way with other acids and bases. Sometimes you'll see the hydronium ion written as a simple hydrogen ion, H+, allowing the reaction to be written with only one water molecule. It's not technically accurate, but it's close enough to reality that it can be used to simplify things. So, would we say that the pH is the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration? Yeah, we actually mean hydronium ion concentration. Just another thing that early scientists got a little bit wrong and now we have to live with. Anyway, this dissociation of water is a reversible reaction, and in fact, the ions always reform into water within a tiny fraction of a second. But it's happening all the time, constantly, in your bottled water, in the water inside your cells, and in the ocean, always. However, at any given instant, only a tiny number of molecules are dissociated into ions. In fact, the exact number of these molecules is well known to chemists. It's the equilibrium constant for this reaction, and because it's such a special reaction, it has its own name, the water dissociation constant, or KW. KW is equal to 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14. The formula for KW is set up like any equilibrium constant, concentrations of products over concentrations of reactants, all raised to the exponents based on the coefficients of the balanced reaction. There is, however, one difference. Because the ions represent such a tiny proportion of the total mass, the water itself is essentially pure. And pure substances, because they don't have concentrations, aren't included in equilibrium calculations. So the formula for Kw becomes simply the hydronium ion concentration times the hydroxide concentration. According to the balanced equation for the dissociation of water, hydronium and hydroxide are formed in a one-to-one -one ratio, so their equilibrium concentrations must be equal. That means if we call the concentration of H3O plus, for example, X, then the concentration of OH minus must equal X as well. So the formula for the dissociation constant, 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14, simplifies even further to X times X, or X squared. Suddenly, it's crazy easy. The equilibrium concentration of each ion is just the square root of 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14. Touch one key on the old calculator and hello, both concentrations equal 1.0 times 10 to the negative 7 moles per liter equilibrium. The pH then is simply the negative log of that, which is 7. This, my friends, is the basis of the pH scale. Water is neutral, so 7 is the center of the scale. And I can prove it, too. This is the strip of paper that's been infused with a chemical called litmus. Litmus is a pH indicator, a chemical that turns different colors at different pHs. There are many different indicators with many different colors, but we'll talk more about those next week. For now, just know that litmus paper turns pink in acid, blue in bases, and a sort of light purple when it's neutral. But one thing you need to remember about the pH scale is that
does create this calculation from a negative logarithm, it turns everything backwards. When the hydrogen ion concentration goes up, the pH gets low. For instance, if a little acid, such as vinegar, were added to the water, the concentration of hydronium ion might rise to, say, 1.0 times 10 to the negative fourth moles per liter, which is a thousand times more than before. That concentration would push the pH down to 4. On the other hand, a base, such as ammonia, would consume a lot of hydrogen ions if it were added to the water. If the hydrogen ion concentration dropped to 1.0 times 10 to the negative 11, a thousandth of the equilibrium concentration, the pH, would be 11. As you can see, the logs turn out to be a mathematical shorthand that saves us from dealing with very huge or very tiny numbers. The pH scale, then, is normally written from 0 to 14, with numbers below 7 representing acids and numbers above 7 representing bases. It could also go below 0 or above 14, but that only happens in super extreme cases that you are very unlikely to encounter, at least I hope. Acids like hydrochloric or nitric acid, which ionize strongly, sometimes even completely, thus releasing a lot of protons, are called strong acids because they raise the hydrogen concentration a lot. They also generally have very low pHs. Weak acids like citric acid dissociate incompletely, releasing much smaller amounts of hydrogen ion, and therefore they usually have higher pHs, generally considered to be like the 46 range. Strong bases, meanwhile, like sodium hydroxide, consume large amounts of hydrogen ions, leaving concentration very low, so they tend to have very high pHs. Weak bases like sodium bicarbonate, baking soda, consume much less and generally have pHs in the 8 to 11 range. Neutral pH is technically just 7.0, but in a more practical sense, it's usually considered to be between 6 and 8. So if pH is based on the concentration of hydrogen, that is hydronium ions, what about the concentration of hydroxide ions? Just as we can calculate the pH of a substance from its hydrogen ion concentration, we can calculate the pOH, the negative log of the hydroxide concentration. This is easy because Kw never changes. Although the concentrations of hydrogen and hydroxide are only equal in pure water or perfectly neutral solutions, the product of the two concentrations always equals 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14 in any aqueous solution. So like orange juice, which is really just an aqueous solution with sugar and citric acid and a few other things, say the hydrogen ion concentration in your OJ is 3.2 times 10 to the negative 4 moles per liter. Just for the fun of it, let's go ahead and calculate what the pH is at that point, which turns out to be 3.5. But we can also use the Kw and the hydronium ion concentration to do a very simple division problem and find the hydroxide concentration. It works out to 3.1 times 10 to the negative 11 moles per liter. And once we have the concentration, we can take another step. We can find the pOH of the solution, which is similar to the pH, simply the negative log of the OH concentration. The pOH, in this case, is 10.5. And now for a tip that's just more awesome and cooler than an ice cream corn dog, the sum of the pH and the pOH is always 14. In the example we just did, the pH was 5.4, the pOH was 8.6. And yeah, you add those together, 14. Bugs. Okay, maybe that's only cool to me, but that's never stopped me before. I love this stuff. And next week, I hope to really bend your mind by showing you how to make the pH of a solution hold steady, even if you dump a strong acid or base in it. In the meantime, thank you for watching this episode of Crash Course Chemistry. If you paid attention, you learned how pure water ionizes to form hydronium and hydroxide ions in reversible reactions, and you learned about the equilibrium constant for that reaction, which has a special name, the water dissociation constant. You learned some examples of acids and bases and neutral substances, as well as why some acids and bases are called strong and others are called weak. You learned about logarithms and how you can use them to calculate the pH of substance, and a little bit about pOH, which can be calculated with logarithms, also with subtraction. And finally, you learned about some cool mathematical connections between pH and pOH. This episode was written by Edie Gonzalez and edited by Blake. Pastino, the chemistry consultant with Dr. Heiko Langner. It was so, how did you like that? At any rate, although that gentleman was a little bit too ambitious and excited about pH, uh, he did. Uh, however, managed to answer about a half a dozen IOM questions in that little video. Uh, and although it probably means nothing to you now, uh, hopefully as we move forward here through the next few slides, uh, it will give you a little bit of a different perspective of, of what we're, uh, we're going to be talking about. Uh, essentially, the next three, four, five slides uh, on pH theory uh, basically take us down the same 
long winding road that he just ran us through. Uh, in, in, in my opinion, in a little bit more complicated way. That's why I like that video. Uh, so let's see uh, how we can relate what we saw in this video uh, into the theory that we are provided with in the ILM. <clears throat> again, so pH theory, again, is the measurement of the water's acidity, whether it's an acid or alkal alkalinity, whether it's a base. We learned that the pH is defined as the negative decimal logarithm of the hydrogen ion activity in the solution, which was fantastically complicated, but uh, very impressive sounding. Uh, what it comes down to is we'll end up uh, determining pH based on the negative log of a certain concentration of hydronium ions. Um, this is one of the math functions that we're going to be doing as we move forward. And you'll see that once we get into these, uh, they're not as bad because, again, as the gentleman told us, uh, the combination of pH and pOH is always equal to 14. So if we can find out one of them, we subtract it from 14, and that will give us the other one. And that really boils down a lot of the more complicated descriptions that are in the ILM here. So keep that in the back of your head for the next couple of minutes. Uh, just to review again, water is made from hydrogen uh, and oxygen atoms to form water molecules and as our friend said a small but steady number of these molecules will disassociate into hydronium ions and hydroxide ions so here we have h2o a couple of water molecules and they disassociate when it disassociates and it releases these hydrogen atoms it creates a higher concentration of hydrogen atoms which means that we'll end up getting an acid out of it if we end up with more hydroxide ions it will mean that we will get a base out of it. And that's kind of what we're looking for as we move forward here, looking at the math. Uh, again, keep in mind that water, uh, pure water, has equal amounts of hydroxide and hydronium. That's why the pH is seven or neutral. And if we have an abundance of either one of these, if there's abundance of H, it's going to be an acid. If there's abundance of OH, it's going to be a base. And that mostly covers what we're looking at here in the next three or four slides. Um, but we'll look at the uh, re, uh, revisit the math that he quickly whistled through there in the video. So as that molecule splits, we're going to end up with 1 times 10 to the negative 7 moles of each, the hydronium and the hydroxide ions. Combined, there's going to be 1 times 10 to the 14. Negative 7 for one of them, negative 7 for the other one makes a negative 14. Remember, the sum is always going to be 14 uh, on this combination. It's just the relationship between two of them. This could be 10. This could be 4. This could be 4. This could be 10. This could be 11. This could be 3. Vice versa, inside, outside, upside down. It doesn't matter. The combination of the two is always going to equal 14. He called this the ion product of water, or KW. Uh, I believe we'll talk about that in the next slide. But again, uh, reflected by the formula here, the amount of hydroxide ions and the amount of hydrogen ions combined together are always going to equal 1 times 10 to the negative 14 moles per liter. And I know when you have no background, this can be a little bit confusing. Um, but hang on, it's not as bad as it looks. Pure water has a pH of 7 or 1 times 10 to the negative 7 moles of each hydronium and hydroxide. It's balanced. They're both the same, so it's neutral. Acid has a pH of less than 7. And this is the biggest confusing part uh, of it, is that uh, acids are lower numbers on the pH scale, and bases are higher numbers on the pH scale. So if you're living in a lucky, perfect world, and I give you an equation, and I say that I have a hydronium ion concentration of 1 times 10 to the negative 5, you're not going to get this all the time, but you will get this a little bit. When I give you this logarithmic re representation of the concentration for hydronium, the exponent, as long as this is 1, the exponent is the pH. So for example, 1 times 10 to the negative 5 means that the pH is going to be 5. The bases are the same, but opposite. So if I have 1 times 10 to the negative 11, then my pH is going to be 11. If my pH here is 5, then my pOH is going to be 9, because 9 plus 5 equals 14. If my pH here is 11, then my pOH, or the hydroxide concentration, is going to be 3, because 11 plus 3 equals 14. That is the 
That is the major point uh, in, in the map as we go through here. Of course, we're not going to give you all those numbers uh, as one times 10 to the negative 7 or something like that. There's going to be some fractional numbers in there. Uh, and he did an example of that in the video. Uh, and we'll be doing that as well as we move forward here. So again, reiterating the ion product, uh, the ion product of water, this KW, is made up of the concentration of hydronium ions and hydroxide ions, and together they always equal 10 to the negative 14. So what is the math that we're going to look at here? What is that going to look like? Uh, example one here says calculate the concentration of hydroxide ions when you add acid to water so that the hydronium concentration is 0.1 moles per liter. So using the formula from the ILM, calculating for hydroxide, we take the ion potential of water, which is 10 to the negative 14, and divide it by the concentration of our hydronium ions. Um, here we have our hydronium ion concentration as 0.1 moles per liter. 0.1 is the equivalent of 10 to the negative 1, so we can then go 10 to the negative 14 over 10 to the negative 1. And with these exponents, it's a subtraction uh, process here. So the hydroxide component is 13. We didn't have to do all that math because if we know that the hydronium concentration is 0.1 or 10 to the negative 1, well, then the other part of it has to be 13 because they have to make up to 14. So again, uh, it sounds complicated as you read through it, but it's really not that bad. So going the other direction here, if I wanted to find out the concentration of hydronium, I can take the uh, ion potential of water again, 10 to the negative 14, and divide it by the concentration of hydroxide. And this would be given in the question again uh, as 0 0.1. So 0 0.1 uh, written as a exponent is 10 to the negative 1. And again, in this case, it's going to be 13. I could do it this way if I wanted to, or I could rely on the fact that I know that both of them added together are going to be 14. And if this is 1, then the other one obviously has to be 13. So the ILM does a relatively good job of confusing the heck out of people uh, usually, but it's actually relatively simple. <clears throat> All right, so pH uh, is the measurement of the concentration of hydronium ions, and because the pH scale is based on that number of 14, we can use the combination of the two to determine the other side of it, the hydroxide ions. Okay, so if we look at the pH scale here, 7 being neutral, any number less than 7 is an acid, anything greater than 7 is a base, and you can see 10 to the 0, 10 to the 14, this makes 14. Minus 2 and 12, 14. 6 and 8, 14. 13 and 1, 14. It's always, always, always 14. And the exponent number is essentially just moving this decimal place over. And the combination, again, is always 14. So pHs uh, have a numerical number of less than 7, and they are acids, meaning they have a far higher concentration of hydronium than they do hydroxide. Whenever we have more hydronium, it's an acid. Whenever we have more hydroxide, it's a base. So you can see here, this is the most concentrated hydronium and the least concentrated hydroxide, so it's the strongest acid. This one down here is the least concentrated hydronium and the most concentrated hydroxide, therefore it's a base. So to find the pH scale value, we go back to that formula that we looked at a few slides ago, uh, where we determine the pH is equal to the negative log of the concentration of hydronium ions. So this is where we're going to get a little bit trickier. We're going to take away our 1 times 10 to the negative whatever and start throwing in some uh, less, uh, less rounded numbers here. But we'll start a little easier and we'll build up to that. So again, just to reinforce what we've learned uh, before, we want to find the pH based on the concentration of hydronium ions. So for the pH for a hydronium ion concentration of 10 to the negative 7, we can do some math. We can take our uh, 
calculator and we can punch in some uh, magical numbers. But if it's 10 to the negative 7, we can automatically know that the pH of it is 7. So I, I can't make it any simpler than that. And it only works when we're getting, dealing with the whole numbers. Uh, example number two, find the pH for a hydronium ion concentration of 10 to the negative 1. Well, it's going to be 1. Example number two here, find the pH for a hydronium concentration of 10 to the negative 14. Well, guess what? Surprise, surprise. It's going to be 14. Okay. So it's not mind blowing at, at this level uh, of math. And you could punch it into the calculator if you wanted to. Uh, and a negative times a negative gives us a positive. That's how that works out. Negative times negative is a positive. That's how it works out. So just to cheat a little bit, uh, I could also ask you at this question right here, find the pH for a concentration of hydronium of 10 to the negative 7, and you would discover that the pH is, is 7. I could also ask you what is the uh, concentration of hydroxide, and you would know that 14 minus 7 is 7, so the pOH would also be 7. In this case, the pOH would be 13, and in this case, the pOH would be zero. So it's always 14. So keep that in mind. Okay, here's some common examples of everyday products and their levels of acidity or alkalinity based on the 14 point scale that we use here. Uh, again, uh, neutral being uh, technically seven, but generally understood as being between six and eight. Numbers that are smaller are acidic. Numbers that are larger are basic. And these are the relative concentrations uh, along with each of those. So nothing really new there either. <clears throat> Where do we use pH measurements? All over the place, as we talked about earlier. Uh, boiler feed water, uh, we, use, we use it to make sure that we don't have uh, acidic uh, medium in our piping because acids, of course, will eat away at the piping and that's bad. So we strive to have our uh, process to be slightly alkaline. Water treatment, uh, again, for the same reason, high pH uh, can corrode lead and copper. And if we have older houses that have lead piping and we have high pH, that means you're going to be drinking it. Uh, pulp and paper, we use uh, pH measurement in the bleaching process. And wastewater, we measure the pH um, just to make sure that we don't have high uh, pH uh, when we discharge the river or discharge acid into the river to kill the fish. So different applications for pH. So that was a lot of science and a lot of uh, this, that, and the other thing. Uh, a little bit overwhelming. Again, it'll take a little bit of practice to, to get through it. Um, don't be overwhelmed. Uh, have a look at the self-test questions in the ILM, uh, and, and it's, it's not that bad, hopefully. Moving now to objective four, we are going to start talking a little bit more about the devices uh, themselves. Uh, and we'll start about start out talking uh, briefly here about electrochemical uh, process measurements and reference half cell reactions. So we're going to be talking about the electrochemical cells that are used for measuring uh, a lot of these properties. So we covered electrochemical cells briefly at gas analyzers, uh, but just to refresh ourselves here, electrochemical cells. Uh, are widely used in analyzers of all types. We've learned that they're used in some gas analyzers as well. Uh, an electrochemical cell, uh, by definition, converts chemical energy into electrical energy. And these cells consist of two electrodes in an electrolyte. And it creates a voltage between the electrodes because the negative electrode produces negative electrons, and the positive electrode accepts those electrons to develop a positive charge, and as a result, you get the flow of electrons. Looking a little deeper into the cell diagram here, uh, cell diagram is the diagram that's used to represent uh, the different types of cells. Uh, and this is, I don't know, in my personal opinion, maybe a little bit deeper uh, than the average uh, technician uh, is probably going to commit to memory. Um, but the theory behind how these cells work is, is uh, helpful to us when we go to you know troubleshoot issues as we move down the road. So cell diagrams are used to represent different types of cells and they contain three components usually. Uh, the negative electrode portion of it, the positive electrode portion of it, and then some type of an electrode. Usually 
these diagrams will tell you the uh, materials that the electrodes are made out of, uh, and they can vary widely depending on the uh, application. So silver is common, uh, lead's common. Uh, there's a couple of different uh, metals that are uh, relatively common, but they do change from sensor to sensor. Um, long story short is most of the liquid analyzers that we use uh, rely on some type, of, some type of an electrochemical cell. So we're talking specifically about pH today. So we are going to talk uh, and concentrate mostly on the type of cell that measures uh, the, the components of pH. And again, those are uh, hydronium is basically the ion that we're looking at when we're measuring pH. And they are measured with a specific probe. And it consists of a re reference electrode half cell and a pH sensitive measurement half cell paired up with a high impedance preamp and a transmitter. So here's what it kind of looks like in a relatively primitive type of picture. Uh, again, the reference and electrode, uh, reference electrode and the measurement electrode in real life are part of uh, part of one housing, uh, and the amplifier is also either part of the sensor or part of the transmitter usually, um, but for ease of uh, visualizing here, we've broken them apart into their individual components here. So we have a reference electrode uh, and the measurement electrode. The measurement electrode for pH is a special glass membrane, uh, which is made from silicone dioxide uh, with uh, embedded oxides of alkali metals bonded to a more robust glass. So if we were to look at this, and we'll look at this in the lab uh, a little more closely, uh, you'll see that they do have a little bulb on the end of them. And this bulb is a different type of glass than the rest of the, uh, of the cell. Uh, and then again, it's got this, uh, this coating on it that allows it to uh, interact with the hydronium. So when the membrane glass is hydrated or wetted, an ion exchange will occur between the hydronium ions and the membrane surface. Uh, there is another video at the end of the lecture here that will make all of this far more clear. Um, but as due diligence, we should uh, try to understand the theory here a little bit. So basically what happens, we put this thing uh, in some kind of a liquid. Our reference uh, solution inside of it will have a pH generally of 7. Uh, and depending on what liquid we put it in, if it has more hydroniums on the outside uh, than it has on the inside, it will be measured as an acid. And if it has less hydroniums on the outside than it has on the inside, it will measure as a base. That's the long story short. Um, to you know, kind of help us through the weeds of the explanation that we see here. So again, that glass is wetted. The ion exchange occurs between the hydronium ions and the membrane surface. It causes a potential difference across, across this glass probe and generates an EMF, um, which we can use uh, in conjunction with something called the Nernst equation, which is coming uh, in order to tell us what the pH is of that particular fluid. Sorry for all the extra words there. Okay, so uh, functions of the individual components here. Uh, the reference electrode there, again, is, to, is there to provide a reference, and it accounts for any stray electrical charges and is subtracted from measuring probe. So the measuring probe will also uh, will be the measurement. Uh, this is the reference. We subtract the reference from the measurement to get our pure signal. Similar to what we talked about when we were looking at magnetors the other day, there's always some kind of interference, and if we measure the interference, we can then subtract it and end up with a pure measurement here. So this is a more realistic uh, image of what the, the probe kind of looks like here. Um, we have the measuring uh, electrode down here inside this special glass bulb. And then we have the reference electrode, which is isolated from this uh, in, within the same housing here. So this is more realistic to what it looks like. Uh, as I was saying earlier, um, the pH inside the probe or the, uh, the fill fluid inside the probe is generally going to be neutral, sitting at 7. So if I have more hydronium ions on the outside, meaning that I have this in an acid, orange juice, vinegar, you know, hydrochloric acid, whatever it is, if I have more hydroniums on the outside than I have on the inside, I'm going to end up with a positive voltage. And that's important to remember this. Okay, If I have the same number of hydroniums on the inside as I have on the outside, it's going to be neutral or a pH of 7, and it's going to have zero voltage. If I have more hydroniums on the inside than I have on the outside, I am going to end up with a negative voltage. 
uh, and that's just a handy little thing to file away in the, in the back of your head there. So I believe uh, next I'm going to show you real quickly a, a video that uh, animates this kind of whole deal going on here and makes it a lot easier to wrap your heads around. Um, so again, remember, acids are positive voltages and bases are negative voltages. File that away because that will help you eliminate some answers uh, in multiple choice questions if you're just guessing without having to do some math. Okay, let's see what video uh, number two is going to do for us. So let's stop sharing this one. Hopefully, I'm going to click on this one. Many liquids are essential in our daily lives. They may include water, beverages, dairy products, chemicals, acids, and bases, or pharmaceutical products. The quality of these liquids is determined by their chemical properties. To assess these properties, various principles of measurement are used. One of these principles is pH measurement according to the potentiometric principle. The principle can be traced back to 1909 when the Danish chemist Søren Sørensen introduced the so-called hydrogen ion exponent pH plus to describe the concentration of hydrogen ions in a solution. This was the basis for the development of a conventional pH scale. In 1889, Walter Nernst formulated the Nernst equation that for the first time related electrical voltage to ion concentration. The Nernst equation derived for pH is the physical basis for pH measurement according to the potentiometric principle. Potentiometric pH measurement the measurement of a potential difference using so-called glass electrodes or non-glass electrodes. In the case of glass electrodes, the pH-sensitive element is a glass bulb that is fused to the end of a glass tube. The electrode is filled with a neutral potassium chloride solution, buffered at pH 7, and contains a silver-silver chloride wire that forms the electrical connection. The reference system is located in the outer glass tube. It also consists of a silver silver chloride wire in a potassium chloride solution. A so-called junction protects the reference system from the medium to be measured without disconnecting the electrical connection between them. The pH value is calculated from the potential difference between the reference system and the measuring system. Let's take a closer look at the pH-sensitive glass bulb to understand how this potential difference is formed. Diluted hydrochloric acid, for example, contains large negatively charged chloride ions and small positively charged hydrogen ions. When the pH sensor is immersed into this acid, the hydrogen ions are able to penetrate the boundary area of the glass membrane, the so-called gel layer. The considerably larger chloride ions remain in the solution. The result is a charge separation. The same process occurs on the inside of the sensor with the neutral solution buffered at pH 7 that has a constant concentration of hydrogen ions. If the hydrogen ion concentration, hence the pH value, on the inside differs from the concentration on the outside, a measurable potential difference forms. If the hydrogen ion concentration on the inside is lower than on the outside, as shown here, the measured solution is acidic with a pH value lower than 7. If the hydrogen ion concentration is identical on both sides, no potential difference forms and the measured solution is neutral with a pH value 7. The measured solution is basic if the hydrogen ion concentration inside the glass bulb is higher than in the measured solution. pH measurement with non-glass sensors is based on so-called ion-selective field-effect transistors, short ISPEC. 
They use a MOX transistor arrangement, which contains a pH-sensitive layer instead of a metal gate. Positive hydrogen ions forming at this layer cause the charge to be separated on the other side. As a result, the area between source and drain becomes conductive. The resulting flow of current is in direct proportion to the pH value of the medium. Just like the glass sensors, the ISPET sensor also needs a stable reference potential. The potential that forms at the ISPET can then accurately be measured against it. The reference system is also protected from the measured solution by a so-called junction. The potentiometric measuring principle by Anderson Hauser enables highly accurate pH measurement for better product yields and less waste. We offer a solution for all applications, even in those industries that do not tolerate glass. For further information on liquid analysis and the latest pH sensor generation, So I hope that shed some light on the previous uh, few slides. I think it basically captured everything that we talked about earlier. So um, I hope you like that. Moving on here to the last objective in this ILM is some wonderfully fun math uh, using the Nernst equation that we were previously talking about here. So we are going to apply the Nernst equation to pH measurements and determine why the temperature correction is required and it's uh, sounds again sounds worse than it actually is okay the nurse equation is used to calculate the voltage that is produced inside an electrical uh, electrochemical cell with that nurse equation we can determine the pH cell voltages from pH values and temperature and this is really uh, what we're getting at here is the, the effect of temperature on pH we can also get pH values uh, from pH cell voltages and temperature. So we can go get voltages from pH, pH from voltages. And then we can also use the Nernst equation to correct for temperature effects uh, on the cell voltage. So we'll do examples of all of them. First, starting out with some incredibly overwhelming theoretical math to make you panic, which we see here. So here's the Nernst equation in all its glory. Uh, and don't panic yet because we're going to boil this down to something that's a little bit more palatable uh, for us. So R is a constant, T is temperature in Kelvin, N is the, uh, what the hell's N is the charge number, all this wonderful stuff. Don't worry because uh, we don't use this exact formula. Okay, so this is the mathematical equation as it is in its existing glory, but we massage this down into something that we can use, uh, which is basically the EMF or the voltage generated by the cell is equal to negative 59.16 millivolts times our measured pH minus seven. And this is at standard conditions, which is at 25 degrees Celsius or 298 degrees Kelvin. So we'll do some examples uh, at this standard temperature, and then we'll use a derivative uh, of this formula in order to compensate for temperature changes. Uh, again, uh, you want to recognize by the end of the lecture the effect of temperature on a pH, uh, on a pH reading. So this number right here, uh, this 59.16, we call this the slope. Uh, and basically, this is just the, um, the amount of millivolts that we're going to get for every step. So a pH of 1 would be 59.16. A pH of 2 would be twice that. A pH of 3 will be three times that, uh, so on and so forth. So um, although the math may seem a little bit tricky um, at first, after you've practiced it a little bit, you can do some pretty good in your head rough calculations um, based on standard conditions um, of other questions where the temperature may have changed. And we'll look at that here in the next couple of uh, slides here, hopefully. So if we're using uh, any temperature other than 25 degrees Celsius, the formula gets up a little bit more tricky, but not really that bad. We still use the 59.16. Uh, we add this one component here, which takes our actual temperature in degrees Kelvin, divides it by our standard 
uh, temperature here in degrees Kelvin to get uh, the ratio between standard and actual. And then we still use our pH minus seven. So we add this component in here when we have temperatures other uh, than 25 degrees Celsius. So again, we'll talk about slope. Uh, slope is the voltage that a cell produces divided by the range of the measurement scale. So the pH scale is uh, 14. Uh, and at standard temperatures, the slope for hydrogen is 59.16 millivolts per pH at 25 degrees Celsius, or 298 degrees Kelvin. Slope is directly proportional to temperature, and we use Kelvin in our calculations. Again, we use Kelvin almost exclusively in all our calculations. So what it's basically telling us here is that the temperature changes, so will the slope. It's important for you to know which way it changes. So let's look at a few examples of this rather crazy math uh, and see what we can calculate or derive out of this. So calculate the slope and cell voltage for a pH of 10.7 at 65 degrees Celsius. So we'll just plug these numbers into our magical formula. Because we're not at 25 degrees Celsius, we're going to have to use the modified formula where we have the uh, this temperature in Kelvin referenced against the standard temperature. So here's what that looks like. 59.16 uh, millivolt per step times uh, 65 plus 273, which equals 338, over our uh, standard temperature of 298.15 times our pH, which in this case is 10.7 minus 7. So if we were to run this out and do our calculation, based on this temperature, that temperature changes our slope from 59 millivolts at 25 degrees Celsius to 67 millivolts at 65 degrees Celsius. So as the temperature goes up, so does the slope number. Now, what is the millivolts going to be, particularly at a pH of 10.7? What will the transmitter show us? We take our slope. 67.10 millivolts per step. We uh, add that into our formula, which is pH minus 7, or in this case, 10 minus 7. So 10.7 minus 7 is 3.7. Multiply that by our slope of minus 67.10, and we get a negative voltage, 248.27 millivolts. Maybe a little bit crazy to look at in, in the first place, but some of the things that you can immediately uh, determine without having to do any of this math. First of all, if the pH is 10.7, meaning it's a big number, this means that it's a base. If it's a base, we know that the answer is going to be a negative number. We know that right away. We know that this number subtracted from 7 and multiplied by the slope is going to give us a number at any at some given temperature. So if I just take the standard, uh, the standard temperature uh, of 25 degrees and the slope at that, which is essentially 60 millivolts, and I go, okay, well, I'm at 7, 8, 9, 10.7, so that's 3.7 times 60. 3.7 times 60 is just under, somewhere right around 240. So you'll know that your answer, if you're looking at multiple choice, just in your head at standard conditions is going to be somewhere around minus 240. So although the, the math can be a little bit confusing, you can kind of work it through uh, in your head and get a general idea of what you're aiming for so that you can uh, determine whether you're heading in the right direction. So extrapolating that formula, we can also calculate the voltage uh, given a pH uh, and a temperature. So in this case, uh, the millivolts is going to equal um, our standard slope times our temperature compensation, multiplied by our current pH number, subtracted from uh, 7. So this will give us uh, our new slope. This function here equals minus 65.09 millivolts per step. And this 3.3 minus 7 tells us that we've got a negative 3.7 steps. So we do a negative times a negative, and we end up with 240.83 millivolts. Again. Simplifying this a little bit, we know that a pH of 7 produces 0 
and uh, a three is an acid, so an acid is going to be a positive voltage, and three is about four away from seven, and four times 60 is about 240, so you can say I'm looking for an answer that's somewhere near a positive 240, so um, it can be uh, it can be worked out a little bit easier. Okay, the third iteration here is calculating the pH given a cell voltage of 92 millivolt and a temperature of 80 degrees Celsius. So this is the worst case scenario here. Uh, we have 92 millivolts. It's made up of uh, our base of 59 times the temperature factor uh, multiplied by our current pH, which uh, we don't actually know. So 92 millivolts is going to equal 59.16 times this temperature converted to Kelvin over our standard multiplied by our pH minus seven, which we don't know. So we got to flip that formula around a little bit more, uh, which gives us 59.16 times 1.184. That's the result of this math <clears throat> times the pH minus seven. So now we're going to have to move some uh, move some stuff around here a little bit. So we have 92 millivolts is equal to negative 70.7 times pH minus seven. Moving that 70 over there to the 92 and dividing it is going to give us our pH minus seven. This is very long and drawn out. And again, sorry about that, but worst case scenario, um, the pH minus seven is going to be uh, minus 1.13 is equal to the pH minus seven. So again, swing this pH underneath here, subtract that, uh, 1.313 from 7 is going to give us a pH of 5.69. That is the worst case scenario here. Uh, again, this is something that we are going to have to do. Yes, there are math questions in the self-test, and yes, there are math questions uh, similar to this on the real test. Um, the biggest advice I can give you is you can read a question really quickly uh, apply standard condition theory to it and it'll get you into the ballpark for sure at least in terms of positive or negative answers and then again a general ballpark in terms of uh, the millivolt number that you're, you're looking at there. So all of these ones have temperature compensation uh, in them uh, just because it's a little more challenging the one without temperature compensation is just a little bit too easy. So uh, again, what you're going to discover if you compare the answers uh, through some of these math questions as we go through the examples, uh, you are going to discover that temperature affects our slope. And because of that, we have to adjust for it uh, by using a temperature compensating temperature sensor. So to put it into something really simple without blowing your minds any farther than it has to be, um, just have a kind of a look here at the relationship here. Temperature of 10, our slope is down from our standard. Our standard temperature here again is 25. So at 25 degrees, we're putting out just about 60 millivolts. At a colder temperature, we have less millivolts. At a warmer te temperature, we have more millivolts. These are all represented by uh, different colored lines here uh, on the graph. Uh, and I believe the only reason that they really put this graph out here is to uh, highlight the fact that it doesn't matter what temperature it is, they are all at equilibrium uh, or zero millivolts when the pH is seven. Uh, and they call this the isopotential point uh, where the pH is at seven. But as temperature changes, uh, we get greater variations at the bottom end of the scale and at the top end of the scale. Uh, and that's what all that previous math that we were just looking at kind of proves to us. So um, again, uh, theoretical stuff for the most part, but it helps you uh, get to the point where you can make some uh, rather broad generalizations like uh, like I have done for you uh, as I described uh, the process here in the lecture. So that brings us to the end of the introduction to uh, liquid analyzers and I guess the introduction, introduction to pH analyzers. Um, we are going to be looking at pH again uh, in chemistry as well, so we will be reviewing some of this theory one more time in case uh, you're a little bit in the fog here still. So that is the end of today's presentation and lecture, probably one of the heavier ones we've had in the last little while. Uh, the good news is it doesn't really get any worse than this as we move forward. So I hope you uh, 
hope you got something out of today's lecture and I hopefully I didn't cause you any un undue stress. And that is it for today, ladies and gentlemen.